Welcome to our Avnei Pina course, which will be run in English. My name is Hermona Sorek. This is Karen Ofek. Karen, please get up. She's the teaching assistant. And we will uh, pass a presence list every lesson. So if you have friends who are building on attending this course, they really should attend. Uh, what else? We will have three home, uh, home missions during the course, which uh, are not very difficult, but will need to be filled. We'll, we'll talk about the first one today. And we'll have a home assignment at the end, and that would be together the uh, grade for the course. What I don't know, I never taught in Mount Scopus, or if I did, it was only to psychobiology students. So what I don't know is what is your background? And that would imply that you need to stop me, especially in this first lesson, and ask whenever anything is unclear. And by the end of this lesson, I hope that we will know What's, what's the level we need to keep and how deep is the background? Okay, the topic of this course will be neurodegenerative disease and the theme will be from research to hope. And I need to open this by saying that I believe that today we are with the research of neurodegenerative disease where cancer research was 50 years ago. That means diagnosis was always too late to treat the patients effectively. The disease was uh, ignored or avoided. No one would admit that they have cancer, which was modified drastically and mainly thanks to research. So today, a lot of the cancer cases are treatable. People get cured and they admit being sick so that they will be getting, that they'll have the opportunity of getting cured. So what we will talk about would be a selection of neurodegenerative diseases, a selection of research topics, and where, do, where are we in this interesting subject? We'll also have experts who study particular uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And we'll discuss that as we go along the course. Oh, and there is a website. And in the website, you already have your home assignment for the first lesson. OK. So <coughs> I hope that you still remember this person. This was Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. Yeah. That's, that's a very frequent problem with me. I once was sent to Mexico City to lecture for the Hebrew University, and I went to the university in Mexico City, which is huge, a quarter million students. There was a hall with thousands of faces, mostly slanted eyes, and, and I got really nervous, and, uh, and then I speak even more softly, and someone from the very end shouted, Lo Shomim! She was from Beersheba. Uh, anyway, so this was Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States, and this was taken not too long after he retired, and he was shown the picture of the White House and was asked, you know, what is this? And he said, this is something to do with me, but I'm not sure what. I think that shows you the impact of Alzheimer's disease much better than many other examples. So it is an incurable brain disorder. It is age dependent. It is mo the most common cause of dementia among people age 65 and older. At the age of 85, we talk about the 30% incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, will this be on the website? 
the presentation. And most of it will be on the website, except for parts that are not published yet, and therefore we can't put them. But that would be after the lesson. It's not there yet. Sure. OK. <coughs> we define dementia as the loss of memory and judgment and loss of language to such an extent that it interferes with a person's daily life and activities. The gradual decline in brain activity leads eventually to death. There was a recent study of the vocabulary used by Agatha Christie, who wrote about 90 detective books over about 50 years or so. So the researchers compared the vocabulary she used in the first 10 books and in the last 10 books. And they noted a decline of 75%. So she used one quarter of the different words she mastered as a young person. She was not Alzheimer's. This is aging-related dementia. But Alzheimer's patients lose their vocabulary much faster at a much younger age. The age of onset for most cases is above 65. And when I say most cases, these would be the cases we define as sporadic. Diseases can be either inherited or sporadic. The inherited disease would be one where we can find a single gene and the carriers of mutations in that gene would suffer the disease. A sporadic disease is not unrelated to inheritance, but if there are genes that increase the risk to come down with it, then these would be many different genes, each of which has a very small effect. And the cumulative contribution of all of these differences is what causes the disease. Okay? Most, like 95% of the Alzheimer's disease patients are defined as sporadic. So it is not a simple disease. Just for comparison, cystic fibrosis is caused by a single amino acid modified in one protein. And that amino acid may be different in Jews as compared to non-Jews because of inheritance reason, but it's a single mutation. Here we are talking about something which is not, in most people, not caused by a single mutation. OK, how come it became an epidemic? Alzheimer's disease becomes an epidemic because life expectancy gets longer. So at uh, 1900, does anyone know what was the life expectancy in the United States in 1900? 49. That, that was the average life expectancy. Today, in the Western world, we are talking about 80 years in average. So there is a very big difference. And people who would die 100 years ago from infection because there was no antibiotics live much longer from heart attack because there was no uh, open heart surgery. Now they live longer. And then we see neurodegenerative disease. An excellent example is that of the Japanese population. At the end of the Second World War, life expectancy in Japan was, I think, 55 or so. And Japanese were dying because of intestinal tract tumors, because they were polishing the rice on asbestos. And there was no Alzheimer's disease in Japan at all. Then they changed the technology. And within like 10 years or so, as soon as they changed the technology, life expectancy in Japan rose by about 25 years or, or 30 years. Today, they have, I think, 85 in average. And, and Alzheimer 85. And Alzheimer's disease is a major problem in Japan. So it is a disease of old age. Now look at the change in life expectancy worldwide on the map, OK? So there is a major difference today. And that major difference is what caused the uh, occurrence of Alzheimer's disease as an epidemic. Uh, today, we estimate there are 35 million sick patients worldwide. 
in the United States, every 72 seconds there's a, a new a person who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And below you see the picture of Alois Alzheimer, who was a, a very art-talented medical doctor in Germany. And he had a patient, uh, a lot of people would show you her photograph. She was 55 years of age and she was hospitalized and she hardly could remember her first name, but not even her family name. And she died and he uh, dissected her brain and drew the pathology in that brain. And I'll show you soon the typical pathologies. He was a very, very uh, talented artist. Today, with much, much better microscopes, people do not see more details than he did. So the disease is named after him. And please do not say the Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer was a person. Parkinson was a person. When people submit thesis, which probably is not the case for you, and say, ha Alzheimer, it's not ha, it's a person. He deserves to be respected. Anyway, what do we know about Alzheimer's disease? What does it cause? I would like to refer you to a website on the uh, New York Times a website of, of a Dutch artist, William Otto Mullen, who drew himself over the years and during 30 years he aged and then he got sick. And as the years advanced, he lost the capacity to draw a face. The details flattened, his uh, capacity to view the world as we do was really gone and he couldn't really remember any details. The same happens if you ask an Alzheimer's uh, disease patient to draw the time of the day. They cannot remember how a clock looks. But to know exactly what happens in this disease, we need some facts about the brain. So here is the human brain. The adult weight is about one and a half kilograms like medium cauliflower, if you wish. We have 100 billion nerve cells in the brain. Nerve cells are about 10% of the total number of cells in the brain, so cells are really minute entities. But we have 100 billion of them, and each of them creates a 1,000 links with other nerve cells. The link is called a synapse. So a synapse would be the interaction between neuronal processes where, through which information is flowing from one cell to the next. And several brain regions are particularly relevant to Alzheimer's disease. Here you see the hippocampus. The hippocampus is important for navigation and learning memory. For example, in the hippocampus of experienced taxi drivers is bigger, it's larger than that of other people because they have to learn navigation. And, and then you have here, this would be the cortex. There are other brain regions that are less relevant and then here is the brain stem. And what I want to, you to note is that the brain is dense. It occupies the entire space of our skull and it's folded. And the foldings are composed of a lot of cells. Now here is what happens in the Alzheimer's brain. We can today view a diseased brain by brain mapping. So what is done is to inject a radioactively labeled glucose which is metabolized in the brain. So you can measure by taking photographs, positron emission tomography photographs, you can measure the extent of activity in the brain of a live patient. The redder it is, the more activity there is in that particular region. And you see in the top map, you see a normal brain, 
which occupies the entire space and shows a lot of red regions. This is an active brain, it's normal. Now look at the Alzheimer brain. You see that someone has put down the light there. The, this brain lacks a lot of nerve cells, and especially you see that in the deep nuclei where a, a lot of the command centers see it sending messages to the brain a periphery, and a lot of the nerve cells are gone already in this particular patient. Now let's look at how a section of the brain will look as the, dis the disease goes on. Here is a frontal section. This region over here is called the entorhinal cortex. It's close to the hippocampus. It gets information from the hippocampus. And the entorhinal cortex is the first region to be damaged. And when you look at the next phase, you see that now the folds are deeper and the brain doesn't occupy in the entire space anymore. This implies that a lot of nerve cells in the cortex has died already. So uh, this starts in the entorhinal cortex and spreads around, and a lot of the nerve cells in the deep brain nuclei are, are dying. So we are talking about the cerebral cortex. This is where most of the nerve cells are located and we see a loss of brain mass as the disease progresses. Okay, the signs at this phase, which is moderate Alzheimer's disease, would include increased memory loss. I, I need to tell you I have these friends that I go to talk to, friends of the Hebrew University, and they become friends and they know I work on neurodegenerative disease. So one day I get this email from a woman who was attending one of my lectures. And she says, I have, I'm really worried, she says. I believe that I'm losing my vocabulary. I make a lot of grammatical errors when I write. I have a problem with short-term memory, which is indeed the first sign. And I'm nervous, and I'm anxious, and I'm confused. And I answer her, you know, you are diagnosing the situation so intelligently that you probably just read about this, or this might be an aging-related phenomenon. By the way, how old are you? And then she writes back, 49. So now I'm much more careful when I answer friends of the Hebrew University. And I met the woman, and, and she's really in a bad shape. Anyway, confusion. Problems to recognize people. Difficulty with langui language and thoughts. Restlessness, agitation, wandering around. Sometimes you hear on the radio a person got lost and they don't know how to find their way back. This is a problem in navigation memory. And repetitive statements, they would say something and then five minutes again, uh, after they will say the same. Yeah. Um, if somebody has mild uh, Alzheimer's disease, do we definitely necessarily have a, a degeneration moderate Alzheimer's disease? I'm afraid so, yeah. The question is, if someone has moderate memory loss, does that mean that he has Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's patients are about 50% of the dementia cases. And if it, if it is another type of dementia, for example, sometimes people get confused with quite parallel symptoms just because they are imbalanced at the level of electrolytes. And these people can, can get, I, I don't know, grapefruit juice and become all better. And that happens. So, Memory loss does not necessarily imply Alzheimer's. And so what's the diagnostic? Uh, the loss of brain mass. Brain mapping together with memory loss is a clear diagnosis. Okay. Okay. And as the situation worsens, we see loss of more of the brain tissue and the patients become dependent on others uh, and, and then they lose weight, one-third of them suffer epileptic seizures, 
and there are generally six. Skin infections usually imply a general inflammatory status, which is very common. And they usually die from pneumonia because they don't get up from bed and they, they just get, they're easy to get infected. Okay. So, yeah. Pneumonia? Pneumonia. Yeah. Pneumonia because, uh, or, or, or aspiration. Because, because they get infected easily. They don't get up, they don't move about. The immune system is weak. The immune system is weak and they suffer increased inflammation. Okay. Okay, so now what did Alois Alzheimer see? You see here two types of pathologies that are particular of Alzheimer's disease. This is called a plaque. An Alzheimer's disease plaque is precipitation of brown material around neurons, which is dangerous for their survival. It kills neurons. And that's one very clear pathology. And the other one over here is called tangle. Tangles are abnormalities in the composition matter of nerve cells. There are a lot of fibrils of proteins that keep the cytoskeleton, if you wish, of a nerve cell, and those go bad in Alzheimer's disease, and they get tangled. So this is called tangles. So plaques and tangles are the main uh, neuropathologies, except for material loss in the brain, which is the primary one, okay? And just to show you the cells. So here is the microscopy of a plaque, you see, a, a, a round brown precipitate. These are the brain cells. And then you see below other cells. These are not nerve cells, but immune cells. In addition to nerve cells and glia, our brain includes a cell type which we call microglia. Microglia are actually derived from our immune system and they protect the brain from immune insults. In Alzheimer's disease, they first become hyperactivated because if you wish, they sense a, an abnormal situation and then uh, eventually they, they just give up and they cannot protect the nerve cells from the plaques. There are beautiful photographs in some studies that show how a microglia, which you see has a lot of small processes, these are the red cells in the bottom, and they sort of engulf the plaques and try to isolate the nerve cells from uh, getting uh, damaged by their existence. So what causes Alzheimer's disease? Over the years, there were a lot of suggested topics, a lot of suggested causes. Aluminum or other toxins were very popular in the 70s. Suddenly, people realized that whoever cooks in aluminum uh, pots gets uh, aluminum dissolved in their food. And that was the time when Teflon was invented, and I, I suspect that that had part in the worries that aluminum foils may cause Alzheimer's disease. Other metals were also mentioned, like lead in the plumbing. A lot of the European cities are still using water from lead pipes, and lead is a very unhealthy compound to be exposed to, so people move to drink mineral water. Infectious agents. Infections do facilitate the progression of Alzheimer's disease, but nobody knows yet if they initiate it. Synaptic abnormalities, for example, carriers of Down syndrome, they all, they have synaptic abnormalities, their nervous system does not function normally, and they all uh, develop Alzheimer's disease at a relatively early age, about 40 or so. Immune abnormalities, we mentioned that. A lack of growth factor, that again was, I think, an invention of the industry. As soon as the human growth factor was cloned uh, and was approved for treating, for example, children that do not develop, the, uh, a piratic industry developed 
to finding other uses for uh, growth hormone or growth factors. And uh, for example, it's used, I heard, in Japan, and that's why the Japanese became so tall in the last generation. But this is sort of illegal. It's not clinically recommended. And it is used in clinics uh, uh, for the aged people. Lipoproteins. Lipoproteins uh, uh, are there to protect our brain cells from other compounds. There are lipoprotein genes that uh, apparently protect or expose to risk the carriers. So for example, there is one gene, lipoprotein E, with four different variants. Carriers of variant number one, two copies of it. Of course, we have one copy in each from each parent. Two copies of, of variant one are protective. Two copies of variant four uh, are a risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we'll, we'll uh, talk about why does that happen in a minute. Other protein abnormalities. And last but not least, oxidative stress, very popular recently. So uh, a lot of people would tell you drink green tea because it protects you from oxidative stress. I'm sure it is healthy. Cranberry juice too. Okay, how do you uh, avoid Alzheimer's disease? So I get asked this question often, and the very first advice is uh, you need to pick your parents very carefully. If that didn't work, then uh, the other advice is I have this friend who says, use it or lose it. Activating brain cells is the best way to protect them. So the idea is that until quite recently we thought that we live and die with the same set of nerve cells, that nerve cells develop early in the brain, and that's what we have to do with until we die. In the last 10 years or so, we are learning that there is cell division, there is development of new nerve cells, also in the mammalian brain, also in aged individuals. People above the age of 70 still develop new nerve cells. But th that those cells are born is not enough to maintain them alive. For nerve cells to survive, it needs to be active. So one needs to keep brain activity to uh, maintain those cells, protect them, and keep the mental capacity at its best. There, uh, again, there is a very proliferative industry recently of computer games. And they would tell you, play this computer game and you'll improve your brain capacity. So last year, there was a serious study of researchers who took a group of people who practiced these computer games and another group comparable, very carefully matched, who didn't practice them. And then after three months, they compared their capacity. And those who played the computer games indeed improved their capacity only for that computer game, for nothing else. So I wouldn't buy that computer game if, if I were you, but reading, writing, uh, that's a different story. So again, where do the newborns form? In the hippocampus, the same region. So to keep our capacity for navigation, we need to keep the hippocampus active. Some people go dancing. That is a very important activity because you have to navigate. Skiing. When, when Israel Uman won the Nobel Prize, I was the dean of the Faculty of Science. So we had a lot of parties for him. He was then 78. And, and of course, I had to congratulate and invent something nice and new every time. And one of these dinners, I was saying whatever I said, I don't remember anymore. And then he got up and he said, Professor Sorek says nice things about me, but from, for me, from now on, everything is downhill. And I got worried. 78, he said, I'm taking the family skiing. 
So he, he is now over 80 and he still goes skiing once a year and he takes all of his family, which is quite numerous. Anyway, so navigation, very important. And I'd like to tell you about a study based on which we believe that brain activity protects it for many years. And this study involved nuns and priests in Philadelphia. It is not a coincidence that they picked that population because they are obedient, they are there, they stay where they are. If they volunteer, they will go on participating for several decades, which is what such a study takes. And what they found is that those nuns and priests who were act actively involved in cognitive uh, capacities, writing, reading, were protected from Alzheimer's disease later than those that didn't do that such activities. Now you can ask me and you'll be right. Where's, where is the chicken and where is the egg? Were they protected from Alzheimer's because they were active? Or were they born with a higher capacity of brain activity and better resistance, whatever would happen? And we don't know the answer for that yet. But uh, it's, it's one of the most important studies still, and it's still going on. It's preliminary right now. OK. How, do, uh, how does learning help to save the new nerve cells? So you can see here a nerve cell which starts from being a stem cell. When you hear about stem cell therapy, these are cells that can differentiate into anything. And one of the thoughts is to implant them into the brain of Alzheimer's patients or Parkinson patients and let them develop and take the roles of those cells that are missing. In Parkinson, this is more developed because there, a very small region of the brain is damaged, so it's more straightforward. Uh, I was teaching last year, I think the, it's 16 years since they started, so the, the, there is a lot of experience already on how stem cell development affects Parkinson patients. In Alzheimer's, it's less developed, but look at the cells. First, the stem cell starts proliferating, so now we have three cells rather than one. Then they start sending processes, which is typical to a nerve cell. Only if that nerve cell will contact other nerve cells and create synapses and send and receive information would that cell survive. So this is why learning uh, logically uh, protects our brain. Okay, a little bit hardcore science. There were a lot of genes that were uh, looked for and found over the years in the search for potential causes of Alzheimer's disease. And we will talk a little bit about some of these genes, a little bit. Because it is important to know what, what we are talking about. So the amyloid gene is the gene that produces those fibrils, the plaques. And it does that when the production of the amyloid protein goes bad. So we'll not go into details of what goes bad, but you need to know that the amyloid gene is the first culprit that was identified. The next gene is presenilin 1, which actually was uh, discovered by a Jerusalem researcher, Professor Efrat Levi Lahad. She's the head of the Genetic Institute in Sharei Tzedek. And she discovered this gene when she was a postdoctoral fellow in Boston. And she told me that she was uh, driving one day back from work with her three years old son in the back seat. And they started talking in the radio because this was a big excitement. Here's a new gene causing Alzheimer's disease when it's mutated. And they said, Dr. Levi Lahad and co-workers discovered this gene. And her son said, Mom, co-workers, that's us, right? <laughs> so I, I like that story. The apolipoprotein E is the gene I told you already about. And it is important to note that carriers of the less active version of apolipoprotein E, version number four, before the last era, they were dying from heart attacks because protecting 
the muscles from lipoprotein, from oxidative damage, is as important as protecting the brain. Only when heart surgery developed and medications developed did such carriers live longer. And then they, uh, it, it, it was discovered that they develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the other genes are less important. Note that they all sit in different chromosomes. And in particular, note chromosome number 21. And do you know where does this chromosome get triplicated? In Down syndrome, exactly. So it is not surprising that Down syndrome carriers develop Alzheimer's disease because they have 50% excess of this protein that tends to precipitate in the brain. Okay, here is our plux look. You see, they precipitate. They precipitate everywhere in the brain. Except that I have this friend in Chicago, Professor Mesulam, who goes around in the world with a slide like that. And he is at the head of an Alzheimer's center in the Northwestern University. And he says, this was a patient of mine. She wrote a beautiful poem one week before she died. I mean, this is made only after death. And she was 91 years old. So that comes to tell us that normal individuals with no cognitive disabilities also develop uh, amyloid precipitates. So the plaques are not uh, a one and all uh, biomarker. And uh, the amount of plaques does not correlate very well to the severity of dementia, which means, again, it is not one gene, it is not one cause. There are mutations that increase the risk, but this is not the only reason. The other element is the tangles that I told you about. And here is how the tangles look in high resolution microscopy. You see that you see the tangles like, like rasta. Okay? And they distort the structure of the uh, nerve cells. And these are formed from another protein called tau, tubulin associated, whatever. Okay. So people would say that there are two major uh, neuropathologies. We will have fibrils in the nerve cell that look like so. This is the protein. Tubulin is the main component of uh, the neurite fibrils. And the tau protein stabilizes those fibrils. So when we lose the tau, everything disentangles. And we lose the tau because phosphate atoms bind to it. And no one knows yet exactly why that happens. So this would be the second pathology. And of course, the question is, so how does one treat Alzheimer's disease? If we believe that the amyloid plaques are a problem, then one should treat the amyloid plaques. And there is a very big research effort ongoing for many years now to develop an immunization against amyloid plaques. The idea is to develop an antibody that would recognize the precipitate but not the normal protein so that it will not prevent its normal activity. And this antibody was developed, and mice were injected. Mice that were engineered to carry the human mutated amyloid gene and develop amyloid plaques. And when they got injected, they got immunized. They didn't develop the plaques. So that was a big uh, rise in the, in the shares of the company that developed that antibody, and they got approval to start clinical trials. And it did work in people as well, except that some of the patients developed encephalitis and died. So that's a real problem. So they stopped clinical trials. They sent the researchers back to the drawing board and are trying to develop now a better immunization. Yes? What about encephalitis? Encephalitis, the leket kromamoach, OK? There are different. Meningitis also. Meningitis affects only the meninges. 
but encephalitis affects the entire brain, okay? And it is a very dangerous disease. But this is, this is going on, uh, so one day there may be a treatment. Some of you may, may hear on the radio that today they immunize girls against cervical cancer. There was no treatment for that at all, and now this, the problem is solved. So, so uh, there is hope that this will be a fruitful effort as well. Uh, the other approach that is used, no, but that, I'll talk about that later. Most of the approaches are aimed at blocking those neuropathologies that we talked about. And you really do not need to remember the details if anyone is worried. Okay. Plaques and tangles. So here is a beautiful microscopy of a plaque in the center and tangles around it. What you see here is that the plaque caused a massive abnormalities in all of the nerve cells surrounding that plaque. So no wonder this is dangerous for the brain. Although, as I said, it is not always dangerous. So some people may uh, survive with beautiful cognitive activities in spite of such plaques, but most of those who have them show the cognitive problems. So, some scientists believe in amyloid. Others believe in tau pathologies. So you have what we call Taoist and Baptist, okay? And each of them would say, my issue, amyloid, would cause the tau pathology, or tau pathology is what causes the amyloid pathology. So uh, you can pick whatever you like but you will see that this is the case with most of the research on diseases. When someone believes in something, they think that this is the center of the world, and the others believe uh, inversely, and that's fine. Okay, how could apolipoprotein E work? It could work, again, by clearing the amyloid plaques because apolipoproteins uh, engulf other foreign entities in the brain. And that could theoretically protect synapses, protect thinking and memory and learning. So and this is taken from a review on apolipoprotein E, and you see that the idea is that this protein would cover dangerous materials and help neurons to migrate, neurons get born in one part of the brain, they need to migrate to another, stabilize the microtubules, the cytoskeleton of a nerve cell, help in synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity implies a change in the synapse as a result of learning. This is exactly what I meant when, we, when I said we need to activate a nerve cell to, to make it survive. And uh, axon guidance, the processes of nerve cells need to know where to get, where to reach, to enable survival, and survival in general. So what you see is, here is someone who believes in apolipoprotein, so they would think that all of the symptoms and problems in Alzheimer's disease are related to this reason. Tau believers will believe likewise. Amyloid believers will swear everything is due to amyloid. But there is a reason to believe that the apolipoprotein E, here, here it, it is shown, can protect the brain because in, in a normal cell, it covers lipid bilayers. You know, membranes are two layers of lipids, and too much lipid is not healthy for any cell. And what lipoproteins do is cover those lipid droplets and take them away. And the question is, can that also avoid the precipitation of the amyloid, which may be the case. Microglia, remember, are the cells of the immune system that protect nerve cells. And the astrocytes are those cells that provide nutrients for the nerve cells, keep the balance in ion composition, they're very important. Most of the brain cells are astrocytes in nature. 
So you have nerve cells, astrocytes, and microglia. These are the three cell populations that are important. And around the blood cell, you may get precipitates too. If anyone heard the news about Arik Sharon, they said he had a vascular dementia. This is what happens in vascular dementia, precipitates on m m very small blood vessels within the brain create a danger for a stroke, for example, which is why he got sick. Yes? Okay, the amyloid is a protein that needs to be cut into several pieces. If it is cut in the correct way, it is not dangerous. If it is cut wrongly, then it precipitates, or the, one of the pieces precipitates, and these are the amyloid plaques, okay? Okay, so it is 30 years that geneticists tried to find a genes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And one day, a pair of uh, researchers in Harvard, Bertram and Tansy, decided to take all of the relevant studies and look for the genes that cause the disease in different populations. Okay, there are different populations worldwide that develop Alzheimer's disease because of an inherited mutation in one gene or another. There is a community of German originated people who live on the Volga in Russia and they carry one mutation. There is a Swedish family that carries another mutation and there is a London mutation. So in different communities, different mutations were found and the aim was to try to compare the efficacy of the different mutations, learning what of the reasons is more important. And what they did was to search the literature databases, pick only those articles that were peer reviewed so that experts looked at them and confirmed their value, only those that were published in English because they couldn't read any other language. Put it all in a, in a new database, double checked everything, and then calculated which are the genetic effects that could be relevant to the importance of that gene they identified to the development of Alzheimer's disease. And this is just to show you the impact of that research effort. Look at the number of samples in each study. It's, it's quite amazing. So a lot, a lot, a lot of people were studied for the occurrence of uh, Alzheimer's disease and the first genes that came up again are the amyloid and the presenilin gene. By the way, the presenilin gene produces a protein that cuts the amyloid. So if it is mutated, then it's not cut properly. That's why people get sick. And in another study, which was aimed at protecting the heart from heart attack, 10,000 patients volunteered to take aspirin on a daily basis. And after 20 years, they checked them, and what they found was that they didn't develop Alzheimer's disease. So the very first protection today is uh, what is called micropyrin. It's uh, aspirin that is coated to avoid damage to the... Uh, uh, stomach, and it's recommended on a daily basis above a certain age, so a lot of people take aspirin. And this is the summary of the previous table in terms of genes. They, they actually said, here is the amyloid gene. This is an important cause of the disease because it can get cut and create precipitates, but apparently different metals may facilitate this precipitation. And the metals were, may be iron or zinc or copper. So the aluminum story was not that far-fetched. And the other region, reasons, the other genes are all involved in the processes that we knew are uh, affected in the Alzheimer's brain. Like these would be genes that when they get mutated, the nerve cells will die or formation of other fibrin proteins, or inflammation responses. So all of the genes they found reasons for 
I don't think that any of those was really proven as a single cause. And we still believe that in most of the patients, the disease is caused by multiple cumulative effects of many different genes. Okay, now how do you study to cure the disease? Of course, you don't want to do human experiments. So instead, we go to a mouse. And what we do is we engineer mice to develop uh, as close as possible symptoms to those of Alzheimer's disease patients. And then we have a model system one can try to cure these mice. I have a lot of physicians in my family and they all say that all I can do is cure mice, which I fail in very, very frequently. So what do you do with a mouse? You can create an engineered mouse with implanted human gene that carries, for example, the amyloid mutation or the presenilin mutation or the tau mutation. And then you can grow that mouse, isolate the brain, and look at its composition. You can look at the genes or the proteins or the cells. You can dissect the cells and check how do they grow or check electrical activity and compare everything you find to what you know of from the Alzheimer brain. Yes? Doesn't that require an assumption that, that uh, the amyloid gene, for example, is the cause for, uh, for Alzheimer's? It definitely does. And so the, you just told us that, that no gene was proven ah, as a single cause. Right, no normal gene. In those patients that inherited such a mutation, like in the Volga or in London or in Sweden, this is the cause of the disease. Mm -hmm. And they develop Alzheimer's much earlier than others. Mm -hmm. So mutations in these genes are very infrequent. But when they happen, they can cause the disease. Mm -hmm. So this assumption that the mouse model will mimic at least part of the disease process is not that uh, far-fetched. Mm -hmm. okay? And actually, no animal use committee would approve the experiment if it was different. When you want to run a, a mouse experiment, you can ask Karen, who is really involved in that all the time. You need to submit an application, and a committee looks at that and says, this reason is not uh, convincing us. You have to come up with another reason, or change the experiment, or cancel it. So people look at that very seriously. OK. But still, there are mice that carry the mutated genes, and I'd like to show you how they show the symptoms. So first, let's look at the, the amyloid. This is the amyloid protein that needs to be cut correctly, or else it precipitates. This is the microtubule that needs to uh, be straight and creates tangles when the tau protein is uh, phosphorylated. You can form amyloid uh, carrying mice with the human mutated gene, or tau, or presenilin. And this is what happens. When you create a mouse that carries mutated amyloid, you develop plaques around the uh, cortical uh, region. And the plaques look exactly like those of the human patients. If you create a mouse that carries the presenilin gene, You'll also get plaques, but they're distributed differently. So this would mainly affect, this is the hippocampus, so it would affect navigation memory, but maybe not other, uh, other uh, functions. And if you create a tau mouse, you'll get the uh, typical tangles quite similar to those of the Alzheimer brain. So what can we do with a mouse that we can't do in a test tube? Of course, we are testing the nervous system. If we want to develop any cure, then you need to be sure that it improves learning and memory. You can treat mice that carry such mutations and then check their learning and memory capacities. How do we do that? The very first test that we use is called the Morris Water Maze test. Morris is a, is a Scotland expert who developed this test, we have a pool. We throw the mouse into that pool, and all mice can swim. 
but I don't like it. We put in the pool a platform. If the mouse will learn where the platform is, they can swim to that platform and avoid the need to, to, to swim any longer. So a clever mouse would do this. We throw it here after several trials. The mouse knows that there is a platform over there and it swims zoom immediately. And the room has a cues, so the mouse probably recognizes there is a red sign on this wall and blue one on that, and they know how to navigate. That's a clever mouse. Now look at the mutant mouse. They make what we call tracing errors. They swim, and they go back, and are not sure, and they hesitate, and they stop swimming, and they go again, and they go in circles. And this is what happens to an Alzheimer's disease patient. So the thought is, suppose we plot the difference in behavior, we treat the mice, and then we check whether the sick mouse got any better. Then we have a beginning of what we call a preclinical uh, research project. The next are maze uh, tests. This is a maze with two arms, so it's called a Y maze. Uh, we put a little bit of food at one arm of the maze. If the mouse is clever, they will learn to always swim, uh, to always run to that arm of the maze where they can find food. If they are sick, they will never uh, be able to decide between the arms. So they'll get less scores in the test. And there is a multi-arm maze which functions just the same. And finally, there's a very clever test that looks at the curiosity of the tested mice. Normal mice are curious animals. If you show them a novel object, they will always prefer that over an object they already know. So they'll sniff at it, and they will go around it, and they will test it. And here you see how a mouse prefers this novel triangle over the already known circle and how a sick mouse will not really differentiate between the old and the new, because as the joke says in Alzheimer's disease, you always meet new friends. He does not know that something is old. Okay, oxidative stress. Oxidative stress uh, would be the production of oxygen, too much reactive oxygen because there is an excess uh, of uh, antioxidant mechanism. So there's too much oxygen to overcome the oxidation processes going in the brain. And that's why we drink tea and cranberry juice and so on. The modern definition would say that what is changed is the balance, the homeostasis, the balance, resulting from oxidant insults. We are always exposed to oxidative stress because we breathe oxygen. But the question is how much of that can cause damage to our cells? And the next question is, so what is damaged by oxidative stress? So that was looked at. And apparently, this, these are photographs of oxidated materials. And what you see here is that lipids can get uh, peroxidated, that proteins can get oxidated, that sugars in the brain can get oxidated, and nucleic acids can get oxidated. So the nerve cells would not work without its DNA and RNA. So oxidative stress is damaging all of the major components of our brain cells. And what would that, uh, what would cause the uh, oxidative stress? So amyloid believers would say, sure, you know, if we have a precipitate, then oxygen gets trapped and we have no protection. Others would say the problem is metabolism. We know that the brain is less active and the energy control in the brain, in any cell, is determined by mitochondria, little organelles that sit in the cell. I'll show you in a minute a photograph of those. So if mitochondria are damaged, then we'll have oxidative stress. 
microglia, these are the immune cells in the brain. If they get too active, that causes oxidative stress. And so on, so metals, of course, metals are a source. You could think of it as the brain getting rusted. And here are actually mitochondria, which in the sick brain are dying off and they are accumulated in those uh, empty particles that you see here that we call endosomes. Endosomes are the trash box of the cell. So when materials are to be disposed, they get into the endosome and pushed out. When mitochondria get there, that means that the mitochondria got sick. So all of these probably are correct, but again, none is the initial cause. Suppose mitochondria got sick, what, so what? It is not only damage to the cell body and to the survival of the cell, but also damage to transport because a nerve cell is a transporter. It produces materials in the cell body and sends them to the synapse. It gets messages through the synapse and sends them on back to the cell body. And who is important for the expansion of energy that is needed to enable its transport? The mitochondria. So do you know, uh, who do we uh, inherit mitochondria from? Mothers, only mothers. So the nucleus is inherited from a combination of mother and father. Mitochondria are only uh, the source of one's mother. Okay, so can we compare the processes that are happening in Alzheimer's disease to other ones? And actually, any acute stress response may in induce the production of these processes that we were just discussing. And one interesting question would be to learn if susceptibility to acute stress is a risk of Alzheimer's disease. I have a friend in Tel Aviv University who believes that uh, post-traumatic patients live shorter and are subject to many different diseases because of the stress. But again, I don't think there is an, a proof for that. So what about the communication? And now let's go back in years, 30 years ago, it was found that one particular nerve cell type is dying first in the Alzheimer brain. Those are nerve cells that react to one chemical, one neurotransmitter. And that chemical is called acetylcholine. And I'm particularly fond of it because that's the topic of our research in the lab for many years now. And let me tell you a little bit about acetylcholine so that you'll understand what it's all about. Until 1930 or so, it was thought that the brain operates as a network. So cells connect and send, send electrical signals to each other. And it works like, if you wish, the telephone cables. But there was one researcher in Germany, Otto Lowy. I have a friend in Tel Aviv University in every international conference on Alzheimer's disease, when anyone says Lowy, he gets up and he says, this is Levy, you should say it Levy. But uh, Otto Lowy spelled his name Lowy. He worked in Germany in a city called Marburg. And uh, the textbooks tell us that he had a dream. At those years, big scientists always came up with a dream. The great ideas came to them in a dream. So he had a dream that the nerve cells communicate by sending a chemical, one to each other. And he needed to prove that. And he had a dream of an experiment that would prove it. And then he woke up in the morning and he forgot his dream. So he was very upset all day. That I'm quoting from a textbook. The next night, he had the same dream again. So he got up, he got dressed, he went to the lab. He did something no respectable German professor would ever do. He performed a real experiment. So what did Otto Lowy do? 
he uh, dissected a frog heart, put it in liquid, and electrified it. And when you send electricity to a plate with a muscle, like a heart, then the heart starts pulsating. Okay? And then he mimicked the activity of a vagus nerve, which uh, reaches from the head to the heart in all organisms, also in us. Okay? So that was fine. Then he took the liquid of that first brain and put that on another brain without electricity. And uh, so, not brain, a uh, heart. And that heart started pulsating. So this was a proof that the first heart was secreting some chemical material which was capable of making the second heart pulsate. And then the textbook said his students came to the lab in the morning and said, this is a Nobel Prize experiment. And indeed, he won a Nobel Prize. In 1936, Otto Lowy won a Nobel Prize for discovery of the very first chemical neurotransmitter. By then, he was no more in Germany because uh, the University of Marburg insisted that he becomes Christian or else he will not get a position, and he refused. So he moved to Austria, to a small town in Graz, and he worked there. Now, in 1936, he won the Nobel Prize all by himself. And in 1938, Germany got a, a hold of Austria. And he was thrown to jail, like all other Jews. And he was really concerned that the world might lose the results of his recent experiments. And uh, I know all that because last year there was a, a conference in Marburg where he didn't get a position, but they did celebrate the uh, study, the 100 years from the discovery, and they got a lot of people into, and they showed postcards that Otto Lowy sent from jail with the results of his recent experiment so that the world will not lose that. Finally, the German government allowed him to give his Nobel Prize money and in return to get a, a ship ticket to go to New York and he died in New York. So that's the story about Otto Lowy. Now, the nerve cells that die in the brain in Alzheimer's disease are those that recognize acetylcholine. And when that was realized, then scientists said, so in that case, what we need is to help the sick brain react to acetylcholine by blocking the protein that breaks it down normally in the brain. And these are the results of their efforts. These are actually all the drugs that today are available for treating Alzheimer's disease patients. Again, they are not aimed at curing, they are aimed at helping the very little acetylcholine that is left in the brain to uh, function. And this, uh, this is the first drug, Donepezil. It's sold by a company called Pfizer. This is the second one which was stopped because it caused neuromuscular weakness. You're not surprised now because you know that acetylcholine activates muscles. And this third one is an invention of the Hebrew University, Professor Marta Rosin Weinstock in the School of Pharmacology. And it's number four in the world. It's sold for about $400 million a year as a patch. So patients go with a patch. Then there is another drug, this one, which is called memantin in, uh, to, to uh, mimic the idea of memory. And what it does is to activate glutamatergic neurons. So I told you about neurons that react to acetylcholine. These are called cholinergic neurons. But 90% of the nerve cells in the mammalian brain react to another neurotransmitter, glutamate. Anyone heard about the Chinese food sickness? People who, exactly, monosodium glutamate in the Chinese food causes confusion and, uh, and hallucinations even in some individuals who are very sensitive to it. That's because 90% of the nerve cells in our brain react to glutamate as a neurotransmitter. So the idea was to uh, help rebalance the glutamate system, but that 
I hear is not a very successful drug. So this already exists. Now the next problem researchers were involved with was how to uh, measure the extent of the disease in a live patient. Until not too long ago, it was said that you can only correctly diagnose Alzheimer's disease after the patient has died. Because uh, the only approval was in post-mortem uh, analysis of the plaques and tangles. And then people said, okay, so if we have precipitates of amyloid, let's develop a compound that will bind those precipitates, label it radioactively, inject it into the patient, and then photograph it in the brain. And this compound had been developed. It is not yet in use in Israel, but it's very popular in the United States. And what the researchers did was first to use the engineered mice to show that they can label the plaques in their brain in a, in a live mouse. And then they moved into humans. Now, I don't know why this slide is here, but let's go over it. So we are talking about Alzheimer's disease as if it's a new age problem. But actually, this is not the case. Apparently, when we say life expectancy increased, that is because of two reasons. Life expectancy in the United States increased within 100 years from 49 to 70 or so, not only because people live longer, but primarily because babies are not dying anymore. So in uh, 100 years ago, a lot of the babies were dying in the first year or so, or up to the age of five, there was no antibiotic, and life expectancy is always an average. But uh, healthy people, rich people, people who had no problem to be nourished, lived longer. And Shakespeare has uh, connotations to Alzheimer's disease, to Parkinson's disease. He knew them all. So he knew old people. And in, in King Lear, you can find this quote that says, I fear I'm not in my perfect mind. Me thinks I should know you and know this man, yet I'm doubtful, for I'm mainly ignorant. What place this is? So here's navigation memory for you. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments. So memory is, pro is a problem. No, I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child Cordelia. So that's King Lear. And, and uh, when we get to Parkinson's disease, I'll probably tell you about what he said about Richard III, who, who, whose head was moving, shaking so badly that he said, we need to put it on a pole and then it will stop pulsing. And that's Parkinson for you. So people who did get old in those days did get neurodegenerative disease. So I would like to uh, spend the last 15 minutes on uh, telling you a little bit about a research project that we are running now in my lab, which is not published yet, so I will welcome your comments. We have to submit it. And uh, we believe we found a new reason for Alzheimer's disease. So let's talk again about why would anyone look for a new reason for this disease? Because there are many open questions, and some of those we just discussed. The first is, what triggers the pathogenesis in over 90% of the patients who do not inherit any specific mutation that we know about? The second is, we know that some elderly people carry amyloid plaques, but they have no cognitive problem. And we know that the mice that develop these amyloid plaques do not show early, develop, early cognitive problems either. Actually, none of the mouse models that I told you about is really mimicking all of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So there still is a good reason to look for no explanations. Okay. So I would like to talk to you about the new explanation which we find. And 
I need to add another little bit of scientific background for that. When we talk about genes, we talk about DNA. DNA is translated into protein, but on the way it produces RNA, which is also a nucleic acid. And humans have about 24,000 genes, that's all. Does anyone know how many genes does the common onion have? See, we would like to believe that we are a little more complex than an onion. So part of the reasons that we are indeed more complex than an onion is that one RNA can make much more than one protein. So from 24,000 genes, we can get about 100,000 proteins. Why is that? Because the RNA can get cut and paste. We call that splicing. And it can cut and, pa cut and paste differently according to the conditions of that cell. If there is a nerve cell, we say there is a change in the splicing pattern when the nerve is activated. So we get different proteins to be produced. And I thought that perhaps this process could be involved in the development of the sporadic disease because uh, it takes a lot of precision to cut and paste everything correctly. Why didn't anyone look at that before? because the technology was not available yet. Because we knew how to look at a single gene, but not at those regions in the gene that we call exons. So we couldn't really analyze the alternative splicing. But over the past several years, we learned about a lot of mutations in many different genes that cause disease because RNA metabolism goes bad. So it is not a crazy idea. We know about mutations like that that cause, for example, ALS. ALS is death of the motor neurons, okay? And Parkinson's disease and many others, okay? So this, these are references, but that's not important. So we said, let's take the Alzheimer genes and the control genes and compare alternative splicing. How do you do that? Actually, there is a brain bank in Amsterdam where volunteers donate their brain for research. And we could order 10 samples of normal brain and 10 samples of Alzheimer brain. And we could extract the RNA and put that in DNA chips. DNA chips are the system that enables us to look for uh, the alternative splicing pattern. So here is how our, our DNA chip looks. This is Amit Berson, this is his PhD project. And he, lo he looked at the RNA from normal brain and from Alzheimer brain. And he asked, you know, how many genes are too active? About 400. How many genes are less active than expected? About 500. How many genes are not higher or lower? but alternatively spliced differently. And it's again about 400. So there is a new window, a gene family, that nobody looked at before because the technology wasn't there. And we looked at the type of splicing and we found that in all of these cases we get too many exons. The gene does not throw out the pieces it should have. Okay. And here are just examples. This is what we do in the lab. We run uh, samples under electrical fields, and we get the bigger ones migrate slowly. So here is a version with an extra piece. You see the red piece? So it migrates slowly. Whatever migrates faster is smaller. So now look at the Alzheimer as compared to control. The Alzheimer always have the two long version. And this is another gene. And this gene is involved in cell death and now it got all bad. This gene is involved in protection nerve cells against insults. So we see a lot of different little functions that go bad just because the genes cannot produce the correct version because the cut and paste process was damaged. 
So then we said, but we know which protein is involved in that cut and paste. Is it missing from the brain? And here you see staining of the normal brain, and this is the Alzheimer's brain. And sure enough, this goes bad because there is one gene that is just missing in the sick brain. And we, ch we said, so would that happen in any disease? No, it doesn't. In Parkinson's disease, we don't see it. So this is selective. So this is Shachar Barbas, who studies these genes also. And what we find is that when we take nerve cells in culture and we excite them, just like Otto Lowy did, we get more uh, cut and paste processes as compared to the quiet gene. So here again, this says, let's activate our nerve cells to ensure that the cut and paste process will be correct and avoid deterioration of the brain. Okay, now that we leave. Okay, and that we leave. And one last experiment that I'd like to show you is in cell culture. What we did was to take nerve cells from a mouse and grow them with or without infection with a virus that destroys that protein that is missing in the Alzheimer brain. So what we've done was, first we had a working hypothesis. We thought that RNA metabolism is a cause. Then we found evidence in DNA chips that this seems to be a realistic situation. Then we could label brain sections and find that the protein important for that RNA metabolism is missing. Now we need to prove that when it's missing, it causes the same problems as in Alzheimer's disease. So we infected these nerve cells with a virus that destroys the protein. This is a control culture. You see, this is, it's like a very thick cluster of nerve cells. These are the processes in green. And the orange is synapses. So we can grow nerve cells in culture. They develop synapses. Now we take one or two viruses, and you see the processes are thinner, they are less dense, and we see less synapses. And if we take both viruses, it's even worse, okay? And we can count that and prove that we didn't kill the cells, but we damaged synapse formation, this, which is what happens in, in Alzheimer's disease. So what would be the ultimate experiment? We need to inject a mouse with this virus and see what happens to their learning and memory. So this is Galit Shaltiel who did that. So here is the virus. She injects the brain of a mouse exactly in the same region that is damaged in Alzheimer's. She looks at the label. The red label shows you that there is much less of that protein in the affected brain. And one month after the experiment, she does the Morris water maze that I just told you about. And look at the control mouse. We put it in here, and it immediately runs to the platform. Here it runs a lot around it because we took the platform away. Just to measure if they remember, even if the platform is not there, they remember it should have been there. But these are the treated mice. And the treated mice make tracing errors, and they swim back, and they forget, and they remain where we threw them. In other words, they fail in navigation memory. And this is just a measurement. And what you see here is that we mimicked the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in these mice. We also did electro EEG, electroencephalography, to find out the electrical activity in their brain. And that's abnormal, too. This is of no interest to you. You implant an electrode. You can do that. We did. <laughs> Come to the lab. Visit us. You'll see. And finally, we said, OK, now what is the cause for this change? And we said, let's try to excite nerve cells by adding an analog of acetylcholine and see what happens to the proteins that we miss. And what you see here is that the protein goes up if we excite the neurons. 
or else we'll inject mice with a toxin that kills those neurons, and then we lose the protein. So what we proved was, yes, this protein is relevant. Second, it's missing in the Alzheimer's brain. Third, when it's missing in cells, it kills synapses. And fourth, when it's missing in mice, it kills learning and memory. And fifth, it is due to changes in cholinergic neurons. So after a long study, we are back to point one. The, those cells that are missing in the Alzheimer's brain, this is what makes them sick. Okay, this is irrelevant. I think that we are done. Okay. Okay, fine. Right. So, I came here to tell you stories, but the people in the lab do the work. And Karen is over here. So she studies inflammation and the effect. And I showed you the pictures of Shachar and Amit, and David is my right hand in the lab. I showed you the picture of Galit. And uh, Geula and Yael used the viruses we talked about. And I need to thank you. And please look for the home assignment. And if there's any questions, send an email either to me or to Karen. Uh, no, oh, thank you for asking. Three weeks. No, no, no. We're not going to press you because we think uh, what, what the assignment is all about are very simple to our mind, papers from Scientific American that are aimed at the large audience, intelligent people who did not get the background, okay? So we're testing it. This is the first time. So you get three weeks. It's, everyone will get the same paper. It's individual work? No, no, it's individual work. Each one needs to answer the questions. We give you very well-structured questions. It's all about one paper, and in three weeks' time, you'll get another one. But uh, if there's any question, please do not hesitate. Yes? Uh, uh, we both read Hebrew as well. <laughs> so that's not a big deal. Okay. Okay, An email address. S-O-R-E-Q. We'll put it in the website. Yeah. And actually, uh, my name is Sorek, and you can find me in the Hebrew University website. It's really easy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.